Welcome back, everybody, to episode six of No Story Left Behind. I am joined this week by my co-host, Steve, and producer, Casey. With us this week is my good friend, old college roommate and fraternity brother, Matt Hobbs, a veteran of the United States Army. Thank you, Matt, for coming down, making the trek to the studio. I know it's a bit of a haul for you. Anytime. Uh, just introduce yourself. So introduce yourself a little bit to the folks listening. Yeah, so uh, not much to tell about me. I'm originally from Wisconsin, currently reside in Minnesota. I joined the military at 17. Uh, loved about mostly every minute of it, a few exceptions. <laughs> um, bittersweet experience getting out, but uh, really enjoyed civilian life since, and uh, great to be here. How old were you when you first thought about joining the military? Uh, okay, so I shocked my entire family by joining <laughs> the military. <laughs> they were like, what, really? Because I never actually thought about it before. Like, for me, I moved out of my parents' place when I was like 15, and then so I joined... Um, right after I turned 17. And so for me, it was a way to get out in the world and do stuff like that, coming from a small town of like 2,000 people, which is a big town in, in Wisconsin, as you guys know. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> the bustling metropolis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so it was a pretty young age. I probably started thinking about 16. My buddy in high school was going to do it. Back the fuck out, you little bitch. <laughs> and then I ended up joining it by myself. What was going through your mind when you first started you know, meeting or talking with the recruiters? Uh, the recruiter I had wasn't terrible, but I wouldn't say he was great either. Um, very pushy. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely want to get those numbers pumped up, especially when there's a low population in the area. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're like, I'm desperate. I got to eat this month. <laughs> and they do nothing to help you. Oh, fuck no. Okay, I'll give him credit, no. though. I had difficulty getting to MEPS my second time. Yeah. And he was like, all right, I'll come pick you up and drive you to Minneapolis. I was like, ooh, Minneapolis. I've not been there before. <laughs> <laughs> No, mine just did nothing. Like, I got my ASVAB scores back, and he's, he looks at it, he's like, huh, uh, 145 GT, and you want to do infantry? And I was like, yep. And he's like, seems legit. And I'm like, <laughs> that motherfucker did nothing to talk me out of it. Dude, this motherfucker, Asshole. I did the same thing. I got like a 112, which is like the cusp is like 111 to do whatever you want tech, right. on paper yeah, that's, anyway. I think one, 110 is you can pretty much do whatever you want. And I was like, oh, I want to do this stuff in Black Hawk Down. 16 years old. Not a fucking clue how reality works. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah, we can totally do that for you. Never fucking once jumped out of an airplane, a helicopter, or anything. <laughs> I'm sure your knees appreciate that now, though. I fucked them up some other way anyway. <laughs> yep. Why did you want to go with the Army over the other branches? I mean, the, there's the running joke of the, the chair force, obviously, being a little bit more cushy. And I've heard stories they have real silverware at their mess hall, at least. I've been to them. It's glorious. That's fantastic. <laughs> it is good. They have they have wing nights and taco bars. <laughs> taco Tuesdays. Yep. They, literally overseas. Steak, lobster and steak Fridays. Like, I, I shit you not. Yep. You wonder where the military budget is going? Air Force menu. <laughs> That's it. When, but, when you're young, you want, like, you're like, I want to be a badass. Like, if I joined now, I'd be like, no, I'm, I'm fucking doing the Air Force. <laughs> they got comfy chairs. <laughs> <laughs> they get to sit. <laughs> no, for me, it was a lot of uh, family, like, history in the background. So my grandparents were Navy, but I don't do well with water, so that was <laughs> not a good idea. <laughs> and my uncle was uh, in the Air Force. He's a jackass. I hope he listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was out. And um, I don't eat crayons, so that like rolled out the Marines. <laughs> so all I was left was the Coast Guard, which Cheers. is more water, or the Marines, <laughs> or the Army. So that was, uh, it was more process of elimination than a conscious decision. <laughs> <laughs> and you said you shocked your family when you said you are going in. Did they say anything? So uh, my parents actually were not very supportive of it. My grandparents actually signed for me to join when I was 17, because my parents weren't around that much. But... Um, they came around in the very end, mostly because, like, you know, all the family stuff. Like, oh, my buddies, uh, guys in the military, whatever. They get the kind of, like, bragging rights from that shit. Um, but other than that, they weren't too involved. So, But my grandparents yeah, were pretty shocked. That. Oh, they, they got all the stickers, it. the T-shirts or there's, whatever. So there's a, uh, there's a house down the road for me. It's like, it's like three houses down that I'm going to take a picture of it and send it to my reserve buddies because I had to reserve for a couple of years to finish out my uh, eight-year term. And I'm going to send it to them. There's, they have a sign in their yard that... Just says U.S. Army, and next to it says, "My son is making a difference," and it <laughs> fucking cracks me up every time. <laughs> I really wish they'd get like a daily video of what he's actually doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! My wife passed some guy in a a dyna last week. Had like a USMC sticker that's like, "My son is fighting for your freedoms," and her. She said the first thing that went through her head was like, "Is he or is he playing Xbox on the fob?" And I'm like, "I've, <laughs> I've trained you well." <laughs> 
I know you have like a hundred siblings. Oh yeah. What did they say? Ooh. Anything? Oh. They were extremely supportive. Like I actually still have this. Uh, it was the most touching thing my family's ever done for me in my entire <laughs> life. And I was going overseas the first time. They didn't care the second time. Like yeah, whatever. Old news. And so they all got together and got me a t-shirt and they wrote little messages on it. Most of it was like, you're crazy, you're a dumbass, but good luck and shit like that. <laughs> but it was like the coolest thing. All my siblings got together and did that for me. So uh, they were really good about it. I have a brother right now who's debating the army. I'm highly discouraging him from it because he's got high IQ and acumen for other technical skills. And so he's not the one that shot himself in the hand. He is not that one. No. <laughs> that buddy, that guy, I would encourage to go back to prison and stay there. <laughs> We have a very colorful family background. <laughs> <laughs> when were you nervous? You know, going to Meps, and then you know, of course, after that, you got boot camp. Meps was terrifying because they don't actually prep you for any of the decisions you have to make. It's freaking insane. They're like, "Oh, you can pick career path." We don't really give you anything except like a two-page paragraph, two-paragraph summary of what it is, and it's like, also, you can sign away two years, six years, or eight years of your life. But and there's a little bit of incentive to it. We don't explain how that breaks down over time. And so, I, if you look at the average age of, like, the enlisted soldier, it's very, very young. I don't understand how recruiters or a different core of people from the military don't have requirements to give better career advice prior to signing these contracts. I know that it's a numbers game. You have to have readiness and all that kind of stuff. But I suffered from that greatly because I probably would have benefited from not joining the infantry if I would have been given some career advice and not just yep. them taking advantage of the glamour of Hollywood movies. They uh, they offered me an $18,000 bonus for cryptologic linguists. I turned it down. They're like, oh, infantry's two grand. I'm like, fine. And then the day before I was supposed to ship out, they fucking got my ass. They're like, oh, hey, there's a problem because you did ROTC in college. You don't qualify for this bonus. You got to come sign this paperwork real quick. Otherwise, you're not going to ship out tomorrow. And like, now I'd be like, fuck you, give me that bonus. Like, I'll wait a few weeks, but yep. that, then I was like, oh shit, like, I want to go, and I signed it, and like, leaving maps, it dawned on me, like, they fucking got me. Yep. <laughs> they yep. got their $2,000 back, and I'm still going to basic. <laughs> yep. They pull on that stuff all the time. Yeah. And I, it's, I'm not saying it's dishonest, but it's a little underhand. I'm sure it's all legal on the up and up, because it's, we have, as individuals, the right to review our documentation and look at that kind of stuff. We are adults, theoretically signing this paperwork, and if you're not, you got a guard that's supposedly looking out for you. But it does, and oftentimes, people joining are like low on the end of the income bracket. Like, economic opportunities for them are very limited. That's one of the reasons why I joined. It was a way to pay for college, get a paycheck, and not rely on other people. So they took advantage of that, and I don't think it's probably the best mentality. But that being said, I would never trade my time with the military for anything else. All mistakes made, everything, I am a better person for it, and I have been set up for success because of it. Since I've known you, you've been pretty analytical and you've stopped me and read the fine print and then broke it down into words that I could understand before. Were you like that when you're going at MEPS or did that, that kind of side of you spawn from, you know, here's this two paragraph little introduction. Here's your career path. And then you see the fine print afterwards. Oh, it was definitely as a result of like my signing bonus <laughs> because the one they don't tell you either. It's like, Oh, by the way, you don't get it for two years and you get half of it. <laughs> And then you get the other half, and we're going to tax you. And it's at all the, taxed. And it's all <laughs> taxed, and we're going to make sure that you're not in a tax-free zone when you collect on it. <laughs> so, so what was it like when you first got at boot camp? I was terrified. Like, I, small town, um, my family is very conservative and religious, and so, like, not a lot of social interaction with other demographics or diverse backgrounds going on there. And so it was my first ever experience seeing what the whole world is like, not what Wisconsin was like. <laughs> And uh, I, I actually did pretty well with it. Um, I definitely fucked up a lot. I was not a popular person. I made mistakes, made everyone do push-ups. Like, everyone's fucking done that shit. <laughs> but um, I learned a lot about who people are, because you get to know everyone very intimately in basic training. Um, I'm yeah. sure you saw how people come in, the different backgrounds, and how they deal with things. It is so eye-opening to how your life is not a standard life. Like, everyone's life is unique and different, and it gave me the perspective to, like, be critical of everything and everyone, but also give them the benefit of the doubt. You can't make assumptions on stuff. Um, and so I almost recycled because of an injury I had in my knee, so I didn't need to jump out of an airplane to figure that shit out. <laughs> I did recycle because of injuries I had in my shins, but to be honest, I probably could have pushed through, but I was an 11 Charlie, and I'm like, if I get recycled, I'll be an 11 Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> but they got my ass anyway, and I had to go to FTU for uh, two months. 
Damn. before they recycled me. And that place was worse than basic training. I was happy to get sent back on the line oh, and I was, get out of that fucking place. I, but was, I was there for like seven months total. <laughs> I would not do that. I was adamant to getting out of there. One of the reasons why I picked infantry was also the short training time. I wanted to get overseas as quickly as possible. I mean, I, I was tired of Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> what is recycle for folks like me that don't know what that is? I'll let you cover it. You did more experience with that one. Um, so if you... It usually is for injuries. I mean, there's other administrative reasons that, like, if you get in trouble, you can get recycled. But usually it's, like, for me, it was uh, stress fractures in my shins. It's basically just shin splints. Um, but if you have an injury like that where it's, like, it's not something long-term, they'll send you – usually they'll send you to FTU, which is, like – I think they call it something else now. It's probably gone through, like, eight different name iterations <laughs> since I was there. Oh, every but, month it changes. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was physical training unit, and it's all the, uh, all the broke dicks who, you know, got broken during their cycles get sent there, and they get sent through basically rehabilitation. They're not supposed to be fucked with. The drill sergeants there are all angry and bitter that they're not on the line, <laughs> you know, training real soldiers, so they're – 10 times the dicks as the real ones are and y you sit there for a couple months and if you don't uh, fuck up or it doesn't break you then you eventually go you know get sent back to a real unit and finish your training but I'd say like at least half the people there end up getting medically discharged because they just like it just drains their soul <laughs> oh it's also where all <laughs> the people who sucks. sign up and don't want to push through can find a way to get out yeah there's a lot of those too and then those sap the motivation from everyone around them yep so. I almost got recycled because they give you all your shots, right? Like, every single thing under the sun. Like, I'm still immune to anthrax. <laughs> like, oh, I yeah. Think, I've got I to get a probably, booster next year. I could year, probably but... snort that shit, and, I would, and I'd be fine. <laughs> I had six years of boosters on that shit. <laughs> <laughs> shit fucking hurt. <laughs> but uh, they gave me, okay, the one that got me the stupidest thing ever, being from a small town in Wisconsin, no one ever gets a flu shot. I got a flu shot and I almost fucking died. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I'm allergic to what they cure the, the the vaccine in, and so they injected into me. They were like, "Oh, you're not doing so well. Got rashy, got a fever," and they're like, "Hey, you're gonna die." <laughs> they throw you in a bunk and they're like, "Okay, have fun." They thought I gave me smallpox. Like even all at the same time, you go and get in line, take your drawers down, bend over, and it's like six shots in your ass. I got out of the penicillin one though, the peanut butter shot. Oh fuck that! Because I'm a, I'm allergic to moxicillin. Or I had an allergic reaction when I was like two. I don't even know if I'm allergic anymore. But I was like, <laughs> nope, fuck no, I'm allergic, and they didn't give me that shit. Well, this is how so, dumb some of the military medical the, staff are. The, the penicillin shot is like, it's called the peanut butter shot because it's fucking thick, and they, they drive that shit right into your ass. It hurts. <laughs> so as soon as I saw that, I was like, yeah, no, I'm allergic. <laughs> well, they diagnosed me with an egg allergy after this whole thing happened. So since then, I've been like avoiding eggs like a freaking maniac. And I had to go to get to, my, to an allergist again, and they did test me like, you're not allergic to eggs. And I was like, what the fuck? This has been years. <laughs> They're like, yeah, you're actually allergic to the virus. It's like, that's wow, not, great. That's actually not even just uh, military doctors, though, because the first time my wife was pregnant, she got diagnosed with um, gestational diabetes, and she was fucking religious. Like, it was really impressive. I was in Kuwait at the time, so I didn't see any of this. But it was impressive as to, like, how strict she was with her diet. And the second time she was pregnant, she brought it up to her doctor, and her doctor ran some tests, and she's like, I'm not convinced you had it the first time. I think they misdiagnosed you. And she, she, she was so mad. She's like, I swore off like pretty much all baked goods for nine fucking months because they diagnosed me with this shit. I'm I like, would be irate. She was so <laughs> mad. Like, well, you can't do anything about it now. <laughs> Talking to other guys on the show, uh, sounds like as soon as your feet get off the bus, they're trying to instill the fear of God in you. Oh, I, God. Was that the case for you or with your instructors? I actually really liked my instructors because they were there for a purpose. And they were not nice about it, <laughs> but they did a really good job. They literally have they have a like a, a not a dump truck, but they dump all your bags out on the grass, right? And then they, if you get off the bus and they put the bags, you two bags you need. You have a duffel and you have a case. And you have to go get both. And they start yelling at you. One says go that way. One says go the <laughs> other way. And they want to see what you do. <laughs> and like I ran off to the other one just like the first thing I heard. I ran. And the drill instructor didn't like that for some reason. Just clotheslined the shit out of me. They call that shark attack, I think, is like the whole thing right there. It was probably one of those memorable days of my life that I remember nothing of. I just remember my senior drill sergeant yelling at me in Russian. Because he, he was Russian. 
and being someone who's like six three and like probably two fifty, just fucking ripped in your face, like, and he his he had a smile like a velociraptor, and like just screaming at you in Russian, I'm like, oh, what if I like what what horrible mistake? Have I made? <laughs> Did you have that drill instructor who would like uh, drink overnight while he's on duty? We had one of those, but no, Kaluzny was like le- legitimately psychotic, and this was after they were like, you can't hit privates anymore, and he was just like. Man, he he threw one guy into a locker because the kid, <laughs> the kid went like this. The kid shrugged at him. He's like, "Are you raising your fucking hands to me?" And like before he even responded, Kluzny grabs him and chucks him, just straight up like launches him <laughs> into a fucking wall locker. And uh, the next day he's gone, and they were like investigating him. And our other drill sergeant, I'm pretty sure they just fucked with us this whole time because our other drill sergeant was like, "Oh, good job, you got him fired." And we're all like, "Fuck yeah, we don't have to deal with it anymore." And then <laughs> yeah. that night. Like, we're all online, and we're, you know, smoking and joking. We're all happy. And all of a sudden, the, the door to the bay gets kicked in. And, and we just hear, woo! And, like, everyone just goes silent. He walks in, he goes, thought you got rid of me. Not so easy to get rid of good old drill sergeant. Oh, and, like, the whole place, like, just deflating goes, oh. <laughs> it's Fucking great. Like, in retrospect, all that shit was hilarious. <laughs> Terrifying what was happening though. Yeah, not at the time. <laughs> we had one. He would play Xbox in like the quarters, <laughs> and he'd get drunk overnight and get lose his video game, come out, and get pissed at us, and put us all in the line, <laughs> and make us do it until he was ready to go play again. Is there any any of your drill sergeants that you know at the time you just absolutely hated, but in hindsight you can look back and say you know they. I appreciate what they did or what they taught you. 100%. A drill sergeant Pearson. This was the most cantankerous guy in the world. He did not want to be a drill sergeant. He was great at it. Fantastic. Because he was there to get shit done. The only reason he was a drill sergeant is because he had two Purple Hearts from deployments to Iraq. From like the opening times. And so he was like, I don't want to be here. I'd rather be out doing my real job. <laughs> so I got to babysit you assholes. So you're going to be fucking good assholes since I can't go out do the job myself. So... That's pretty common. Um, our two best were, well, the Russian guy who had incredible PTSD. Um, that was my first experience with PTSD is anytime he was talking, didn't matter where he was at, even if his back was to the wall, every like 20 seconds he'd go, and then he'd keep talking. And it was just like, after a while, you're like, this this motherfucker <laughs> is crazy. But yeah, he, uh, he just was like, you are not going to get other people killed. And then we had another one, the one who drank all the time, who was like, my best friend, died in Iraq because one of his privates couldn't carry his own pack and asked, was like, I, I need help. So he stopped. And as he was trying to get the private's pack off, he got shot in the head. And he's like, you are not going to be those privates. And at the time you're like, man, fuck this guy. But you know, those after lessons, being overseas, they do it for a reason. Like, yeah, that's like stupid privates are like drunk drivers. Like they get everyone around them killed, but somehow they don't die. Yep. It's How, sad when they do go, know about but <laughs> No, I agree. We had this one drill sergeant. Zing. I forget his name. But his biggest thing was like, I don't care how good you are at shooting or whatever, but if you ever point your weapon at somebody absentmindedly, you have potential to kill them. So like one thing they don't teach in like in like civilian life for weapons control is like muzzle awareness and all that kind of stuff. Like how many times have you been walking around with someone out hunting and they put the rifle down or over their shoulder or up in the air, regardless of like who's oh, standing I go, around them. I go them. fucking nuts. Same, same here. I mean, I have this tattoo because someone was fucking around with a law. And, you know, I I mean, fucking around with an M4 is one thing, but fucking around with a rocket launcher and, yeah. Burn shit. People die. Yep. And you have to point it. They're standing behind you. They're dead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the back boss got him, so at least that was some justice. Yeah, I I would never trade my time. Like, I learned uh, the necessity of operational efficiency, consequences of your actions. Um, in an environment to where it was much more forgiving than reality. So that allowed me to move ahead with that mentality and make fewer mistakes and learn from them if I did, which I definitely made a lot of them. Did you use a lot of that, or did you find yourself kind of thinking about that stuff in civilian life? You know, like, we went to college together. We served on a few different committees. Did you find yourself stop, think, how is this going to affect other decisions down the road? Oh, hands down. Um there's something to be said in making decisions in the moment. I think that's the image a lot of people have about veterans in the military. It's like you got to make a quick decision to live with whatever the consequences are. The reality is, though, that soldier, no matter what their rank, what they're doing, they're not just thinking 50-50 chance 
good or bad. They're going through everything. Where are my people? What do they, stuff do they have? What do they need? What's our mission? What are our mission parameters? All of that at the same time. But you have to do that in like two seconds. And that's generous. So there's something to be said about it. The ability you learn, you gain from the military is to take in a lot of information extremely quickly and make a concise decision. So decisiveness is the outcome of all of that training. It's not that you are Houdini or you can, your brain's a black box <laughs> pumping out magic numbers that let you make the right decision. It's you learn from all those experiences. There's a reason privates make mistakes. They don't have the experience. Training takes you so far. Do you feel like you prioritize, though, that uh, decisiveness? Yes. In life now? Because I, I've found that, like, even just, like, listening to, um, listening to like, political interviews on podcasts uh, over the last few weeks, I found that the one candidate that I was like, I actually like this guy, was uh, Pete Buttigieg, who's also a veteran, because anytime they ask him a question, they'll, they'll try to throw, like, curveballs, and he'll just answer decisively. And it's like, even if you don't like the answer, and I'm like, it, you know, he's given a straight answer, and he's, stick, and he's sticking with it, like... And I, I like I just take a step back and like why why is that important to me and like it, it's because of the military because they instill that decisiveness in you, and like making a making a, a you know a decent at least a decent decision with the information at hand and you know in a split second. Agreed, so. because inaction is an action. Yeah, the time you waste it's making a, a decision, you have no control at that point. At least if you make the decision, it's your call. You're in control of the situation. You might lose it, but. You're guaranteed to lose if you do nothing. So I, I totally agree with that. And I, as far as like the, the images we see from ourselves and people in the civilian life, I totally agree. I find people who behave in a militant fashion outside of the military much more relatable. And so when I see politicians or I see leaders at work, people who have that kind of quick thinking to mentality, go forward approach, deal with it as it comes, I relate to that a lot. And so um, I have to step back sometimes because like you said, you might not yeah. like the answers, but you're getting enamored with that behavior. Yeah. Because um, you relate to it. You would not do well in northern Wisconsin. <laughs> People move at a different pace up there. Yeah, fuck that. Why do you think I moved? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you said you made a lot of mistakes in boot camp. Did you, did you have learning experiences to the point where you stopped being the fuck up after a while? Or no one does. Down? Like, the, I don't care who you are in basic training. You are there to learn, and you and to learn, you make mistakes. Um, could I have done things better? Oh yeah. Like, uh, I was not the most socially aware person of what was going on in the group. That was something I definitely learned from the military, how to be part of a group. And, uh, because of that, I never picked up on that kind of stuff. You have the competitive people, the support people, uh, the strategy people, like you've all these different kind of minds that's working together to make a cohesive unit that you've never met before. It's a struggle. And the people who can like pick out where the strengths and weaknesses are, are the ones that excel. And they're going to make mistakes. We had this one guy. His name was Alex. Um, his last name was actually Alex. It was the weirdest freaking thing. <laughs> and the other guy's last name was John. I don't know what the hell. The Alex parents Alex? Uh, I, think, I think his name was Justin Alex. And then we had, so I forget the other guy's name. We just call him John. But um, this guy was a great leader. Like, he was very intuitive. He knew how to relate to people. But he sucked at making decisions on the fly. But as far as managing people and the staff, so you, like, got on board with an idea or with a plan, he was great at it. So would he ever make a great like troop lead or a, a squad leader? No, probably not. But a team lead where he's getting directions and having to, being told what to do and getting his team on board to get it done, 100% good. I would have never picked up on that kind of detail like a more experienced um, uh, soldier or civilian would do in some cases too. So after boot camp, where did you end up being sent off to? I was out in Texas and Mississippi. So I was at Fort Bliss, but I think before that was Ooh. Mississippi. Yeah. That's where I went straight out of basic. <clears throat> it's not a fun place. It didn't last long. <laughs> so I, I had all these plans when I got out. Like, okay, because like, I was married at the time. I got married on con leave because, you know, I was a private, and that's what we do. And it was I like. I that somehow. I almost did it. I'm so glad I bailed on it. <laughs> I, I'd already been with her for three and a half years, so it wasn't I had like, like a, one year, and I was gone for eight of it. <laughs> <laughs> it was more like. Like, the, the Army will start paying me for this as soon as we're married, and we already know we're going to get married, so we might as well do it. But when I came back after graduating, I'm like, I had all these plans. Like, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to I'm gonna find an apartment. I'm going to take leave, come back and get you. And like, it was a good fucking plan. And then I got down there, and they're like, hey, welcome to 141. We're going to Afghanistan in three weeks. And I was like, oh, well, fuck my plans. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did the exact 
opposite of that. I got back and I was like, I want to go overseas. I was like, well, we just got back from rotation, so we're not going. I was like, I want to go. They were like, this other people are going. I was like, well, I'll go with them. So I ended up going with the 106th Airborne, and it was probably one of the best days of my life because what happened was they reorged the battalion. So all the people that had just gotten back were now supposed to be not allowed to deploy for the whole nine month hold period or whatever it was, nine or 12 months. Yeah. And so they're like, we got to find volunteers to fill this unit because the unit has to deploy, but the people aren't allowed to deploy. And so it was like perfect time for me to get out of basic training or an AIT. So I went over there with them and it was 100% volunteers and it was the best experience I've had in the military ever because every single person wanted to be there. That has something to say about our, our military for all branches, like being volunteer based is why we're so powerful, I think. Everybody there is for a mission, and they support the mission, even if they don't agree with, like, everything that's going on. Agreed. And so I, I absolutely loved it. But, yeah, to your point, when I got back, there was, like, little downtime. I just up and went. Done. Back thing, AIT. What's that? It's specialist training. It's, like, um, it's diff- it's called something different now, isn't it? Like, advanced so, technical um, training? Uh, well, for for infantry, because we just do everything at Benning, it's called OSET, which is one um, one-site unit training. Of course, this was eight years ago, so it's probably called something different now. Um, yeah, mine was eight years ago. Definitely not longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, it, it was great. You know, you did you did your nine you did your nine weeks of basic, and then you had your graduation, and then the next day you were immediately back in, you know, not basic training, but actually basic training for another five weeks. So we did the one so. station unit training. I was there solid through, and I think it was like the nine weeks and like eight weeks or whatever the total was. Yeah. And um, but it's it's your job skills training. Sometimes you go to a different base to do it. All the time it's the same same location depending on how they have space for you and things like that. For infantry, it's always done at Fort Benning, or at least it used to be. It was the only place you could do infantry training. But, but if you're infantry, don't they just give you a rifle and tell you where to point it? You'd think they'd be that simple, but you can fuck that up pretty badly. <laughs> you can fuck that up pretty badly. We literally had a guy, this this poor kid, like it was, you remember the live fire exercises, right? Yeah. Huge props for them. It's like, it's like the first time we're giving these kids rifles, and we're kids. We're fucking children. I was 17 years old giving assault rifle grenades, everything. Things no child should ever touch, <laughs> but I couldn't drink. Just fucking bullshit. Right. And so this poor guy, we're doing lane bounds, right? It's like learn to take cover fire and get up position while being covered by your partner and like getting like, you know, team movement stuff. And part of it is when you go down, you have a loaded rifle, your battle buddy is your left or your right, your rifle's gonna have to point left or right while you go down. Cause you're only up, it's like, I'm up for two seconds, I'm up, they see me, I'm down, you're back on the ground. And so this poor guy like went up, ran, and then he's going down to take cover for the next guy to bound up so they can alternate position. And his rifle goes off and literally puts around like three inches from this guy's face. Whew. This guy had rocks and dirt in his face that got embedded into it, but he was fine. Survived everything. But that's, it's that simple. It's not so much like the guy was going the right direction. He was pointing the rifle to the proper place and shit still happens. That's why we train. And that's why we take it seriously. So how long were you doing... AIT then at that point before you jumped in with 106. Um, I had only been back about a month. And so is it you're saying, Steve? What you were what five weeks? Yeah, it's not. It's is it a nine set? nine weeks of basic, five weeks of OSAT. It's literally just another five weeks of basic because. Oh, you mean how long were we? Was I in AIT for? Yeah. Oh, it's all the same. It's all the yeah. same. Oh, I yeah. was just wondering if it's like. You know, if it's a set time. They did have that really cool play. infantry museum, which I don't know if they'd built that. Oh, yeah, they still have that. Yeah, I don't know if they'd built that um, when, when you went through. What 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 year did you do basic? Oh, six, oh, seven. Okay, I think that was pretty... F- I went through an 11, and that was pretty... Uh, that was pretty fresh at the time. It was that, like... That museum. It was, it was fucking cool, though. I liked it. The history was really yeah. nice about it. So when I'd go d- back if I was in Georgia. I mean, there's nothing else to fucking see in Georgia. <laughs> <so>. Nope. <laughs> Swamps, I've heard. No. Where did oh, or where did you end up being deployed to? Uh, so I went to Iraq. I ended up going to uh, Balad was the base we were stationed out of, but we were um, convoy and escort ops. So a lot of what we did was taking either materials or VIPs off to different things. Um, we actually did a K crossing mission, which is like where you go across the borders to different countries and stuff. And in this case, to Kuwait, uh, did that a few times. But other than that, I actually was one of. There's a rare opportunity for me to see the entire country of Iraq. Um, I don't know how true this is. You know how like you're a grunt in a truck. You don't actually know where you're going. You trust the the truck commander, the troop commander, to know what the shit's going on. Right. 
So all of a sudden we get a call on the radio. It's like, everybody, we fucked up. We got to go back. We're like, what the hell? It's been like two days. Where are we going? <laughs> and so they're that like, shit yeah, sucks. we're in Iran. <laughs> 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 Whoops. <laughs> so apparently they have this navigation system before navigation systems were like that simple to use. Called the Blue Force Tracker. Do you guys have those? Yeah, they uh, they've replaced that now, but they were they were like talking about replacing it when I get out in 2015. They're so fucking dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> they're fucking they're fucking old. They probably haven't actually replaced it yet. They'll probably just talk about it for another decade. Well, this guy was going off there, and apparently their map just tells them like landmarks and heading, and there's no like geographical borders outlined on it nope and so we're just like driving along in this direction looking for a landmark that we never fucking found <laughs> and all of a sudden we see these fucking like oil field towers shooting flames and then we're like there's no oil fields in iraq over here <laughs> fuck <laughs> you were saying earlier you wanted to you wanted to get out of wisconsin you wanted to go overseas when you first arrived i mean was it all that you dreamed or Oh God, no! <laughs> what, what, what were you thinking, and you know what was it like? So the the slogan that sums up everyone's military career. I don't care if anyone disagrees with me. It's one hundred percent true. <laughs> it's hurry up and wait. <laughs> <laughs> they want you to do whatever you need to do right now, and then you're waiting for two days to do the rest of it. I actually didn't like do any waiting on the way out there, which was fucking weird. Like, the mobilizations are pretty fast paced. Like I'll, I, I'll agree with that. I uh, between. The day that I got on the plane at Fort Bliss to the first time I got shot at was, was fucking eight days. See, we got lucky. We I don't know what was going on. We were there in, uh, I must have been in basic in 06, because I was in country 07 and 08. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's what it was. That was a fairly rough period, if I remember correctly. There was a lot of stuff going on. Um, Blackwater was getting in trouble. Um, they were actually out of the lot, I think, at the time. At least they were through there a lot. We saw them coming through once in a while. Um, but, yeah, we definitely had some rough stuff. We, luckily, were one of the only units that year who didn't lose somebody. Or that's what our leadership told us. I don't know where you get stats on that kind of stuff. But. Yeah. We they they told us all kinds of stats, like, hey, we got 40% of kinetic activity for Afghanistan for this month. And I'm like, where did you even get that? <laughs> Who's keeping track of that shit? And why aren't they helping? Like, yeah, like, like I feel like their time could be better invested in sending us more A-10s or Apaches. And I'd agree with more that. More kinetic at- activity. <laughs> That's what that is. And you said your convoy? Was that yeah, convoy ops. We did some. Okay, I didn't do any of the QRF stuff, but we did some quick response force things R- for the RC- base. RCP. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yep. I need you guys. I did to that water. for two weeks and I hated it. I fucking hated it. So quick response force is okay. where you actually support like either a base or operating position or something like that. Um, and if there's contact to an actual like location or outpost, you respond to it. It's not like. You don't want to take anybody out of your towers and stuff like that. So you have a force that's more dynamic that moves around to respond to things. And it could be miles away, like five, six miles. It could be right at the gate, depending on where the contact or where the suspicion has been found. Um, But, yeah, a lot of the stuff we dealt with was IEDs and snipers. That was one of the biggest. We rarely had gunfire, like our machine gunfire, because they were pretty smart. Like, I don't care what anyone says, those guys had their shit figured out. Some of them were dumb, as there's every every military group. No, they like, they... They have us pretty well figured out. Yep. Like they Especially knew, by 07. They knew, well, yeah, and in, in 11, after 10 years in Afghanistan, they knew when a plane was coming in, if it was a show force. Basically, if it wasn't an A-10, it was a show force. If it's an F-18, a Mirage, whatever. If it's an, if like they could, and you can tell when it's an A-10 because they're so fucking slow. And loud. But if, <laughs> but if it was an A-10 coming in, they would scatter because they knew that they, like, those fuckers mean business. Um, but anything else, like, and those F- F-18s would buzz, like, a couple hundred feet off the ground, and they would just, like, be like, meh, because they knew they weren't going to do anything other than pop flares. It's but, too expensive. Yeah, it's too expensive. We dropped one JDAM, and that's because our uh, our PL essentially lied about how many people were in the Wadi because he wanted to see him drop a JDAM, because they're like, you have to have at least 12. And he's like, how many militants you see in that Wadi? And our, our uh, um, I forget what they call Des- designated marksman that's what it was the guy that they throw the erb the ebr at and like you're a sniper now but he's like oh i see i see five guys in that wadi and the feels like yeah i got uh 15 guys in that wadi let's uh drop some ordnance like oh my god that was the only reason we got to drop a bomb like, <laughs> that's fucking cool <laughs> 
I think we only had air support once, and it was from like a Blackhawk, and that was it. Oh, we had a shit ton of air support. No, not us. I think well, it's just because we were uh, we were fairly close to Bagram. Like, but you guys weren't mobile either. You were stationary, right? We were. We yeah. We had a cop. Yeah. Um, up in the mountains, where there was one pass in, and it was lined with IEDs. So Fuck. they sent us a shit ton of fucking air support. Yeah, that we were uh, we were mobile on our own, so we could like do extractions and relocate and stuff like that on our own. So we ditched trucks once in a while. We had so we didn't lose any troops. We lost TCNs like all the uh, third country nationals. It sounds super insensitive, I know, <laughs> but they're pretty much people who um, get contracted from third world countries to come drive convoy vehicles that are unarmored with sensitive equipment because they're high targets. We don't put our own people in them, um, and we lost a few people that way. But un- other than that, we got really lucky. We saw fire more often than I probably remember. I, I remember things like I don't, I didn't even think about or realize happened like until like four years later. I was like, oh shit, that's right, that did happen. I, I vaguely remember, um, and I was, I was fairly uh, drunk the, the first time we met, but I vaguely remember you telling me that you had a round that had gone like graze the side of your helmet mm-hmm. and then the army tried to get you to pay for it you know? <laughs> and that's that stuck with me that stuck with me because when i got out i was meticulous on my shit Good. Like, they are not charging me for shit and then you know they got me for a couple things anyway but it, was it, certainly, wasn't, it certainly wasn't a 700 dollars helmet i kept my whoopee i paid for that like, oh, i would that's too. mine i wish i would have done that i oh, still have i still have security that. blanket it's uh <laughs> So, so they have a they they issue your ponchos, and there's this poncho liner that's uh, supposed to go inside of it. Nobody really uses it that way. Nope. It's 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 a blanket um, that's really lightweight, packs down really well. It's affectionately known as the Whoopie, and essentially this is like your best friend. It's like, also super soft. It's awesome. <laughs> I still use it. So, if you're running convoy ops, what's your day to day like? If you're not, you know, if you if you're not being told to go drive to location A. So since we have equipment, um, our non-mission time actually doesn't have a lot of downtime, or it had um, past tense. Um, so we had um, ASVs the first time with uh, 1151 Humvees. It's 1151, right? It's been a long time for me. I think it's 1151 Up Armors. Uh, we had Max Pros, so I, I oh, don't you remember. Were, oh, that's right. You were 11. You had all the, um, the MRAPs and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. They were pretty awful, but, you know. Top heavy, but they're secure. You're not going to get hit yeah. by nothing in those things. Um, so a lot of what I did was vehicle maintenance in the downtime. I did vehicle weapon, vehicle and weapon maintenance all the time. So we had, um, the ASVs are dual crew operated system and it's a crow's nest system. It's enclosed. And so you have a, you can mount anything from a 249 to a 240 to an M2, uh, 50 cal machine gun. And then there's always a, um, Mark 19 automatic grenade launcher in there. Um, and those things are Tickle mistresses. <laughs> you guys had you guys had crow's nest on that. Uh, we had a crow's nest on one, and we had the one in the level fifty one. And then, um, can you talk about the automated the co- yeah. com- the so common cr- crow's weapon nest station. is like you are sitting in the vehicle with the screen, and you're just turning a joystick. Sure. It's like a fucking video yeah. game. I've seen it once, and that was because we had a. Well, the ASVs have two systems. There's the one because yeah. in the crow's ne- the crow's system, you don't move when the turret moves. In the basic system that the ASV has, it's still an enclosed turret system, but you're in a basket that moves with the turrets. You're always facing. That makes no difference. I don't know why they did yeah. that because you're yeah, that you can't orientate in a closed vehicle really anyway. Sense. So because you're looking down a periscope, it seems like it'd be more expensive because you have to have that much more equipment in there. Yeah, it, it broke all the time. <laughs> I saw it, and I think it was the Buffalo. It was one of the engineering vehicles because it was one of the two convoys I did with RCP that got blown up, and it was a. Uh, the vehicle in front of us got blown up and that it was in like three fucking pieces and they brought one of the, the driver from that to our vehicle because we had the medic in the back of our Max Pro and he's like, this, this kid like, oh, that was fucking sweet. And our TC, who's like one of the hardest people I've met in the army, he's like, slowly turns around. He's like, I've lost a lot of good friends to IEDs. And he's like, yeah, but it was still fucking sweet. And I'm like, this this kid's about to die. He deserves but, it. But he, uh, I, I got kicked to the engineering vehicle so he could take my spot and, like, the medic could keep an eye on him. And, uh, I, I'm like, they had a crow system in there, and I'm watching the guy just, like, spinning circles. And after he did, like, five circles, I realized he was asleep on the crow system. It was, Dude, like, three in the morning. You th- okay, that's not an excuse. <laughs> no, I'm but, sorry. Like, we, okay, so my second tour overseas, we're in an MRAP, right? Yeah. And we f- let this young kid get up in the turret and we're stopping for a security check because we see suspicious activity we see what's possible it was an ied actually 
and we're like, hey, the 525, it's where you do a 5 meter perimeter check followed by a 25 meter perimeter check so you can see if your area is secure. And we call it up to this guy because MRAPs are big. You can't like yell right. in there, it's loud. So you have radios inside the vehicle. And this kid's just not responding. And so I'm driving this thing and I just lean back and look up in my seat and I see this fucking stupid ass glow coming from a turret of a vehicle supposed to be running on blackout. I fucking lean further, and this guy's watching a movie on his fucking phone. Oh, my God. I fucking grabbed the emergency release, kicked him in the back, and we had VIPs, like generals in the back and everything. I looked at his secretary, and I was like, get the fuck up there. <laughs> oh, this is fucking dumb. And my, my the truck leader had no idea. It, we, 88 uh, mics. Never trust 88 mics. <laughs> we had, um, because that, that same convoy, we, we ended up sitting there for like eight hours, which is the stupidest fucking thing, because usually they follow up with an ambush. After they after they blow you up, mm -hmm. but they're like, no, this vehicle's in like three pieces. We can't leave it. We got to get the engineers to come out from the fob and blow it up. And so we're sitting there from like, it was. I mean, it was like almost midnight. You guys when don't this carry started. like incendiary devices and stuff like that for that. I shit? guess not. I mean, that was on the engineers. We were just there to you know provide security. So we but, we so we're, always brought stuff to destroy sensitive equipment. We, we should have because they're like we said we ended up sitting there for like eight hours and like. Halfway through, um, one of my buddies was in the back of the Max Pro, and if you're, you're in the back, you're pretty much asleep because yep. you don't do. you don't have windows to look out. You're just you're just sitting there. It's you know it's loud as shit. It's cramped. Like you're just gonna go to sleep. And he uh, he wakes up to them calling on the radio his vehicle, and he like looks up. The driver's asleep. I'm like all right, whatever. Like we've been sitting in line for fucking forever. The TC's asleep. The truck commander. And he's like, okay, well, as long as the gunner's awake, that's the important part. Yep. And the gunner's fucking asleep. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he had a similar moment where he freaked the fuck out. I but, would, I did not let that kid in a vehicle with me for, like, months. <laughs> <laughs> no, we would have we beat the shit out of him. <laughs> we weren't allowed to. That's It's the softer, kinder army. Hearts and minds. <laughs> <Correct>. um, <laughs> What what was your primary job then? If you're you're in infantry, but you're doing convoy work, convoy work, and you're driving, but you said you're you know you're fixing. So my a lot of so it's you wear a lot of hats. There's not like you have these are your responsibilities and it's all you have to do. Everyone pitches in wherever you're needed for a lot of stuff. Um, if you have a good team lead, they will give you specialization areas, but you still cross train on absolutely everything. And to be effective at that, you swap jobs all the time. Also, it makes life so much better to not do the exact same thing for 12 months straight. <laughs> if you have, if you have, you know, 15 guys that can drive a Humvee versus four, then you know, if for some reason one of them isn't available, it's not a big deal. But exactly, um, especially weapon systems, which are so finicky sometimes. Yeah. And so you're doing lots of cross training even in downtime. My main job was gunner. Most because I was a shit driver. <laughs> I go too fast. <laughs> I Oh, my God. I scared the shit out of my old sergeant so badly. Uh, so we were, this is my second tour, we, we were in uh, Ashraf. So you guys heard of the Mech. They're that Iranian terrorist group that Saddam who gave um, refuge to. And then the U.S. signed a ceasefire agreement with them. And so the U.N. said that we had to protect them during all this engagement in Iraq and things like that. Well, we were, we were that attachment that was doing that protection. Um, and doing UN escorts and stuff like that. And so um, there's a roundabout in this, like, podunk little refuge city. <laughs> and you take a, a Humvee through a roundabout at about 45 miles an hour. <laughs> it feels like a Ferrari at 200. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so, I mean, what were you doing for fun? when you, I mean, you said you didn't have much downtime, but I imagine you have to do something to try to keep yourself sane. So Video games. <laughs> there's a lot of video games. I wouldn't say a lot of video games. Um, the second tour, there's a lot more video games because it was a lot lower time. It was like 2009, 2010, so things were like a little bomb got in. The, the troop movements had gotten a lot less. It was more operational capacity and less like actually on the uh, offensive capacity. Um, but the first tour, um, I cannot emphasize much like how much time we spent fixing shit. <laughs> we actually had our own motor pool because we had, I think, almost like 30 vehicles for our company. And so we did like full on like twin turbo diesel engine swaps and ASVs and we had our own record crews and I was like certified on a fire truck. Um, <laughs> like not like a traditional like you think like rolling down the street to go to your house. Right. It was more like an LMTV, a light, yeah. um, what's the M stand for? Light movement troop vehicle or? Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, so I forget the acronyms. And so in the back there's this fucking tank with an air, with an air uh, a compression tank that's got like 
all the chemical foams in it, and there's an air tank on it with a, like a hose that's not big enough to put it all out properly. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, if a vehicle catches on fire, use it to put it out. I was like, all right. <laughs> we used it like once and realized, you know what's not worth it. Let the fuck it burn. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. we've talked in college, you know, pranks that you pulled on. I remember you're telling a story. Your, I want to say sergeant, I believe, took away your energy drinks or something. I'm trying to remember. What an asshole. But right before you did a night convoy and you took your chem sticks and this your, your splattered, his, oh. splattered, splattered his Humvee or whatever it was. Okay, I'm not proud of this one <laughs> at all. This is so dumb. <laughs> so this, uh, so the uh, the troop command, the truck commander, like not the not the TC, not the guy, the not the team lead, but the guy running the entire convoy, told us that we all drank too many energy drinks, and so he was like, "We're not loading up energy drinks this time. You have water and you have Gatorades. That's it." That's a good way to die. Uh, he about did, and yeah. it was totally our fault. <laughs> so um, we he did this. We go out on a mission, and we're stopped for, I don't even remember what, probably just a basic check, but we had the brilliant idea to snap the chem sticks we used to light the path, cut the tops off, and then chuck them at his <laughs> zombie. <laughs> and so... It sounds like a blackout mission where one Humvee is like luminescent. <laughs> <laughs> and we all thought it was the most hilarious thing until we took fire and they were just fucking getting lit up like motherfuckers. <laughs> we That's felt very great. bad, but no one got hurt. <laughs> Did he find out about that? Well, he I was in the if truck. He's the only one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, by the time you got to wherever you're going. Out. He saw the truck glowing. He knew about it when it happened. <laughs> There's just not much you can do. <laughs> what are you going to do? Stay inside right. the armored vehicle that's glowing or go outside the armored vehicle and wash it off. <laughs> they, know, they know who to shoot at. They're not, they're not stupid. We had uh, Did you guys have wolfhounds? No. So, like, so basically you have... Um, we, I forget what the system was called, but we could like listen to... Um, tail band traffic and we had two of them set up so we could kind of get a you know a line on where they were at but if you have three then you can triangulate them so we'd have the wolfhound which is this pack with this big fucking antenna coming yep. out that you'd carry around and it would let you uh you know it would let you triangulate their position you know at least somewhat um accurately and the antenna on this thing looked like a fucking helicopter rotor like it just comes up from the pack <laughs> and it goes way out my buddy's carrying it and he's like I'm going to fucking die. It's like, they're going to take one look at me and be like, this guy's the commander of all the Americans. Like, kill his ass. Like. It's a real thing, though. They try to find who's in charge. We'd have to rotate, like, they have, uh, they have leadership nick- positions all the time. Did they, have, uh, did they have nicknames for you guys? Like, did, were you able to listen to their chatter? So, we, since we worked in the AOs of a lot of operating bases, we did no uh, chatter monitoring. We had to okay. go through the landowners every time to get intelligence. Okay. And it was for a good reason. It's like, I know it sounds like, well, it didn't sound very efficient or whatever, but a lot of the traffic is bad. It's really funny to listen to, especially yeah. when there's an eclipse and they're talking about how the Americans have stolen the moon. I'm like, this is a perfect opportunity to get, you know, a Blackhawk out there with a speaker and be like, hey, when you surrender your arms, we'll give you your moon back. <laughs> like, fucking idiots. Or like, say you realize that they're just like you because the one guy got hit in the foot uh, with a 50 cal, which means he doesn't have a foot. <laughs> or half a and leg. One of his, yeah, or half a leg. That's because our, uh, our gunner was trigger happy and dumped the entire can. So he's lucky he only got hit once. Um, but he like... One of his buddies had at like sarcastically asked him over the radio, like, "Hey, how's your foot?" And he's like, "Go fuck your mom." And I'm like, <laughs> "They're literally just like us." <laughs> <laughs> we got dumb people in our dumb. military too, and I'm sad to say it's mostly the officers. <laughs> oh, we we had the most lieutenant moment I've ever seen. My first lieutenant, his idea of a mission brief was to pray before we'd leave the wire, and then we just leave the wire and be like, "Where are we going? What are we doing today?" What do I do if I get shot at? Like, it's what's called the mass plan? suicide. There was no plan. It was just he would just pray and then we'd leave the wire. And he got up one morning and he pointed off the our little JSS, which was like maybe fifty meters on each side. It was just a tiny little um, clot hut that they'd taken over that we'd taken over and turned into a security station. And he got up on the wall, points, and he's like, "We're going that way today, west." What is the purpose and, of your mission? And someone's like, "Sir, that's east." And he's like, "Yeah, whatever." I'm like. We're all going to fucking die. I would have gone home. Uh, he, <laughs> one of our NCOs spotted him with his own Glock um, that he'd brought with him and promptly turned him into S1 and got him fired. Thank God. And I did not trust that NCO because he was a rat, but at the same time, I was like, 
thank fucking God, because he would have gotten somebody killed. <laughs> we had our he was RPL editing. banned from every mission probably like two months in. He was green. He was a second lieutenant. And we're on mission, and he's in charge of this mission somehow. I don't know how he got in charge of an entire convoy of stuff he had never had the training for. And all of a sudden, he calls for contact in a tiny little village. And he's like, there's a ninja! Ninja! Six o'clock! And we're like, what the fuck? Are we in Japan? And thank God, one of the staff sergeants is like, hold your fire! Hold your fire! It's like, it's a lady shopping! <laughs> Oh my this God. guy literally want to fucking open up on some woman in a fucking market for wearing a, a burka. Ninja. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I have no affection for NCOs in leadership <laughs> roles. <laughs> oh, sorry, um, officers in leadership roles. Did you ever get deployed to an area that was pretty active combat-wise? Yeah, the first tour. To drive to or uh, the whole country pretty was pretty hot. So there's like MSRs, the military supply routes, yeah. and those are high, high traffic targets, and that's what our main operation was. So first tour, we were definitely, that stuff was going on. Uh, second time, uh, we had mostly, uh, it's hard to explain. Um, so you have the Iraqi army, there's the Iraqi police, and this a, mil- a former militant, demilitarized group, the MEC, that we were supposed to be protecting slash... Uh, mediating between the local new government we put in place in the country. There was a lot of violence between those two groups. We did not have a lot of violence from any insurgent groups outside of the area. We had some, but it was pretty pretty minor. Um, so it was more like domestic infighting in the government we put together the second time and actual like combat stuff the first time. So, yeah, I would say the first tour was definitely more eventful. Hey, what was your going, going through your head that first time? You know, if you're taking fire don't die don't die don't die don't <laughs> die <laughs> no um we it's were pants shitting the first time okay the first time we got i took fire i was driving and um it was terrifying it was oh, what the taj uh is it taji was that base in the southern part of iraq i believe so i haven't been to iraq okay oh. uh i'm pretty sure it was it was it was taji and we looked into iraq from at, from kuwait but <laughs> on, my, on my second and much worse deployment Second deployments always suck. The first ones are like the romance period, yeah. like the honeymoon have, tour. Have you ever been to um, to Buring? Oh, yeah. yeah Camp I Buring? Spent, I fucking I spent, hate that place. I spent seven and a half months there, and I wanted to fucking seven die. Seven and a half months? Mo- I was there for like three weeks. I wanted especially, to shoot myself. <laughs> especially after they, because I, I jerked them around for a while and whether or not I was going to re-enlist, because I really liked my squad leader role, and I really didn't want to get relegated to the, uh, the ACAP platoon. And uh, after about two months, they realized what I was doing and promptly fired me and replaced me. And I went to the ACAP platoon and spent five and a half months. That's, that's um, I forget the acronym stands for, but the guys who were getting out, they're like, all right, go off and you know do your own thing, which sounds great um, for about three weeks. And then you're like, what the fuck am I doing with my time? Because <laughs> oh, you're in a miserable. desert with nothing but a USO tent that has two TVs that doesn't work. <laughs> but they did use me as op for like two days after they fired me, and that was glorious. Oh, that's cool. I got someone's weapon away from him. I escaped as an EPW. It was it was a whole thing. I, I, I loved I, I made training all, scenarios. Those I made fun. them all look like fucking assholes, which was great. <laughs> oh, I love doing that. You're doing the mode training. You ever do like oh, the, the the paintball scenarios? You're like yeah. assaulting buildings from the street and everything. Uh, urban operations. Yeah. This cadre of instructors were so fucking arrogant <laughs> they like whooped us so bad so finally we're like you know what we're breaking every fucking rule we're gonna go in there we're just gonna pelt them with paintballs <laughs> it was the most glorious event of my life now did you have a chance or did you care to uh keep in touch with family and friends back here when you're overseas i kept in touch a little bit the first time and then after that it was a lot of effort because <laughs> you're like on the you're on mission a lot for like sometimes days or weeks at a time and you're definitely during that time you're not doing anything and you don't want to answer questions every time you call home and so they're always thinking you're dying at every single moment <laughs> which sucks and then at the same time they think that uh, you don't have anything that you need and they must send you everything under the sun including the kitchen sink which always <laughs> which always seems to amount to half a box of Jolly Ranchers and beef jerky <laughs> I, to this day, cannot stand beef jerky. We got so inundated with Jolly Ranchers that we started giving them to the kids. And then the kids got so sick of Jolly Ranchers that they would throw them back at us. These are kids up in the mountains with nothing. No 
like no candy whatsoever, and they got tired of Jolly Rancher. <laughs> and just, like, you get fucking pegged in the helmet with a cherry Jolly Rancher, and it really puts things in perspective. Take like, that over a rock. <laughs> yeah. That was the worst thing I hated, like going on like convoy ops, was when you're in a fucking open turret in a Humvee, and you have to stay up in it, and you're getting fucking pelted with rocks. I, I was this close the one time, because we were on a, on a roof in this uh, village, probably like 500 yards from the cop, and it was like there was a bunch of snow on the ground, so... Uh, we, th- we were throwing snowballs at these kids, and they were, like, throwing the snowballs back. And it was a good time. They were really good with throwing snowballs. So uh, we were getting nailed a lot. And then I finally pegged the one kid. He had have been, like, six. And I pegged him right in the head. And he's like, oh, and he picks up a rock. Like, he's going to throw it at me. And I and I racked my forty eight, and they just fucking <laughs> said. <laughs> Life lesson right my, there. My, NCO, my NCO's like... Are you really gonna do that? I was like, fuck no! I didn't want to get hit in the head with a rock. Like, I'm not gonna shoot a bunch of kids. Just don't don't pick a fight you the- can't win. <laughs> just don't want to get hit in the head with a rock. Like, they're really fucking good at throwing things. Like, I cannot overstate that. We picked a snowball fight with the A and A once, and we got destroyed. <laughs> uh, Hobbs, did you have time? Did you ever come home on R and R? I did. Uh, each time they require you to go home for two weeks. It's not an option. Did you come home see family, or did you? I, don't, I had a deer with my car one time when I came back. <laughs> that was great. It's like, oh, okay, tomorrow's my flight back to Iraq. Oh, and I told him my car. <laughs> but that was um, actually that was actually the first time we met. I was on R and R. Oh, I remember. Yeah. yeah, that was a good time. That bonfire was fun. I that remember part not, of that not night. for you. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, the, the the most of it was fun carrying you up the stairs. <laughs> not my favorite memory. <laughs> for everyone listening, uh, and not watching live Hobbs is significantly smaller than I am and at the time in college I think I was about 275 63 he's being very generous to himself <laughs> I, I, had, uh, I had stopped in in Germany on the way back from Afghanistan and bought a bottle of absinthe which I proceeded to feed to Gordon almost <laughs> almost the entire bottle yeah I, we, we each had a little bit and then let's be had, real we all had samples and Gordon, and Gordon had the bottle had the rest, <laughs> and uh, he was throwing up all over himself he had to get carried up the stairs and I was like my work here is done and I left <laughs> <laughs> for the record he did not help carry Gordon at all I did not I did not <laughs> I slept like a champ that night I don't know what you guys brought oh. <laughs> I had a crick in my neck. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the USO tent with the two TVs that don't work. Yeah. Did you ever have, did they ever send entertainers out for or when you were there? Not for us. Um, there's more there now. Oh, there's I'm like, sure there there's is. like eight TVs that don't work. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I got to polish my truck after coming off like a six day mission because Dick Cheney was going to come shake hands with people. <laughs> and we were like, I don't fucking care. I want to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best when you get like politicians. I remember when we were coming back through Kyrgyzstan, there were like three senators. I don't even remember who the fuck it was at this point that showed up and a bunch of us were like sitting down in the shade and like three people got to go like got up to go meet them and the rest of us were like, I don't fucking care. Like I'm in the shade. I'm tired. Like I don't give a shit about these people. <laughs> No. And I, honestly, I don't really care about the inter- entertainment stuff over there like that. Like we had yeah. enough stuff going on that I would much rather like get shit figured out. Wait, looking back on it now, uh, being out of the military, I mean, what are some of your favorite memories of being overseas? Ooh, uh, shenanigans, <laughs> shits and giggles. <laughs> I mean, the other parts of it are pretty shitty. <laughs> <laughs> If the people there weren't so great, it would not be a good experience at all. For some reason, the, the almost dying parts are a lot funnier in retrospect. I it's, don't know why. Because the risk is gone now. Yeah, maybe that's it. And I think like watching people get chased by wind scorpions, that was fucking funny. And our, our, camel our, spiders? Our, our, our RTO was, we, we only found one camel spider. It was pretty small, but we did have a wind scorpion, which is similar. They're not actually scorpions, they're... I don't know what the fuck they are, but they um, they look fuel. like spiders. They're pretty like this one was probably about this big. Can't see my camera is about that big. They have two front legs that are for like sensing that they hold up in front of them. That it just looks super aggressive, and it was uh, chasing our, our our RTO, the radio operator, essentially, <laughs> and because it wanted a shade, and he was terrified of it, so he was running from it, and it was chasing him, and it was one of my favorite moments of the deployment. <laughs> Well, you have to have so, pets. Like everyone, genius. everyone has a pet overseas. Everyone thinks of the, the stray dogs. Did you ever dogs. do cage cage matches with uh, the hedgehogs with fucking... and the scorpions? Did you, you put hedgehogs and scorpions? Yes. That's <laughs> fantastic. 
<laughs> Who won? The scorpion. <laughs> Jesus. Well, okay, so there's two types of scorpions that are over there. There's the ones that everyone thinks are the black ones or whatever like that. There's the probably more variations. Yeah. Those aren't as poisonous, apparently. No, the yeah, black the ones the aren't as bad. The it's the, it's the small there. ones that you got to watch out for. We found and trapped one of the like white translucent ones. Whew. We named him Eugene. We kept him for like four months. <laughs> <laughs> and we just put things in his cage and let him fight them. <laughs> Jesus those hey. must have been pretty tiny hedgehogs, because the hedgehogs we had in Afghanistan were like this fucking no, big. No, no, like little ones, like this. Because we, like the first time I saw it was the day I was leaving, and it was, you know, it was nighttime, it was dark out, and I had my headlamp on, and all of a sudden there's a fucking gigantic hedgehog in the path, I'm like, I didn't even know these things existed over there. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? All oh, the ones we had were like the size ones. of a hamster. Okay, yeah, that's... It was, was still like, pretty impressive, because the scorpion was like that big. Yeah. Or that big. <laughs> But no, we, um, awesome. entertainment wise, it was a lot of sh- like just tons of pranks on people. Some guys just jacked off all the time. But for the most part, and you also had to do projects like we built like entire structures for the motor pool and stuff like that. So your downtime, you're actually working, but you're making it better for the next group of people that came after you. Um, and so some of the bases that get built up, like the core buildings, were never actually contracted by the military. They're built by soldiers just trying to make their lives more livable. <laughs> yeah. It we uh, we had like the shower trailers that we built like an entire hut over yep. because we were tired of walking around in two feet of snow. And you think that'd be something simple? It's like it's just a it's a shade cover. Yeah, that's all it is. Talking with Corey, Josh, and Penny, they said they were welding on extra armor and stuff to their vehicles. I mean, did okay, you ever so do anything like that, that was very very early on when IEDs became much uh, or much uh, first introduced to the campaigns um, because. And they were not um, ready for that. They were not start. ready for that. And that's why there were so many deaths in the beginning and so much worry going on. Did the um, military, for lack of better words, fix it by the time you went in? Yes. Kind of. So th- they, they did a to good an, job. To an extent, yeah. They gave they rolled out the uh, the, the Puma. There's a vehicle called the Puma. That was a European model vehicle they rolled out that was armored that they, we used for a while before my time. They were still in service when I was there, but most of the European um, groups had those. Um, they created the new line of, um, of Humvees, the 1151 being the main one that was up armored to the point to where it would not fucking move, <laughs> yep. but you would not get blown up as easily. <laughs> um, and then you then had what the ASVs, which were the enclosed turret systems, which by far, I think while they were uncomfortable as fuck, they were tanks on wheels. Literally they were angled. They had tiny windows that were layered glass. So even EFPs could not get through them. Um, EFPs are explosive. Seriously? Yeah. We we had our third platoon. They literally had an EFP smack straight on the glass. And it went through like a good three panes of that so six pane window. An, an EFP is literally just a carbon rod that it, the, the mechanism, um, break it down as simply as possible, These has two plates that slam together and it shoots this carbon rod out at high velocities and like superheated and this thing will go through a fucking tank that's the modern version the e the ied versions they use literally coffee cans okay and so okay. what happens is they get I was gonna like say that like, like that yeah, rod that will go through that rod will go through fucking anything yeah, th- that is <laughs> but like, it's really expensive so you don't have to worry about it that much they don't have the resources for it no they, did, they, they definitely don't have that we have that which is awesome yeah but <laughs> what they had was a coffee can that they would put a concave metal disc at the end and that was the end you would face towards whatever target you have and they put a blasting cap in the back of that was a fixed end of the can and they'd fill it with whatever uh, combustion they can get what happens is since copper is a soft metal that maintains its structure when it's heated becomes an explosively formed projectile that concave thing now becomes a missile flying because you know aerodynamics and it's superheated so unlike a bullet which gets hot it'll stop when it hits cold steel it just won't penetrate Whereas the explosive form projectile will melt through armor that's inches and inches thick. So even the 1151 Humvees, the MRAPs and stuff like that, EFPs were a major issue. Um, they were highly inaccurate, which was a, a blessing for us, but they're very innovative at the same time. Yeah. But so the um, ASVs, though, we saved an entire one of our teams because it luckily landed right on the driver's window, on the side window. And it went through, like, three of the panes of glass. It had been on anywhere else in the vehicle, it would have went right through the thing. <laughs> so, um, I forgot the original question. Uh, I forgot the original question, too. <laughs> <laughs> Got to find a new host. <laughs> uh, you were talking about um, 
early armoring versus that's right yeah so they solved a lot of those issues and even then they put on some more stuff that's even held with the efps um and a lot of it became and they got really good at actually detecting ieds using rollers the buffaloes and all yeah. of that other technology um they the definitely thor the uh what's the other one the goalie oh yep yeah yeah, there's a that they their names are stupid. <laughs> the, the the goal or Goldie Goldie or goalie, I don't remember now. Is a uh, essentially looks like a hockey puck, and you carry it in front of you, and it's supposed to pick up wires. And um, the guys that use it just end up tripping over it all the time, which is fucking hilarious. But and then the Thor is this backpack that's supposed to emit a signal that'll interrupt like um, command detonated IEDs. So like if yep. you're using a cell phone. But the signal that it gives off just gives you a major headache, which I'm sure in 20 years will be cancer. We called those. So, the, we had the Duke system, which is what it the was. Duke in the, does vehicles. the same thing. Yeah, the Duke does that the same thing, thing. Splitting headaches. Oh my god, it's so bad. Yeah, so I'm sure in 20 years a lot of people are going to have brain cancer from the yep. from that fucking thing. I'll die long before that with my lifestyle. I'm going to get lung cancer before I'm 40 from the burn pits, so you know yeah. I don't have to worry about brain cancer. <laughs> But yeah, they, they upped the technology game um, quite a bit in the early years of the campaigns. And it's war. People are going to die, unfortunately. But they did make great efforts and strides to support yeah. the troops. So after your second tour, you know, what was it like when you're coming home? I mean, were you... So it was... Did you get a reception from friends or family? Or is it... I no? didn't tell anybody I was coming home. <laughs> I... Okay, you were going to laugh at this. So... I got my last tour ended in 2010, and it was about three days before the spring semester of Rafal's uh, university started. And so while I was overseas, I was staying up late at night to do like applications for college and stuff like that, knowing I was getting out. And I got accepted, and they're like, Yeah, classes start on the 26th of January. It's like, Okay, I get back into country on like I think the 18th. I've got a week of demo, and then I gotta somehow get to university. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's even that's even quicker. Like I, I got back. Um, well, they they were nice enough to send me back in October so that I could make my first child's birth, which didn't happen. Oh, anyway congratulations! Because she came several days early, and it was like a two-hour labor, and you can't get from Colorado to Minneapolis in two hours. <laughs> but you know, they actually did everything in their power to support me on that. Um, and then I got out in December, and I was still on terminal leave when I started school at Minnesota. Terminal leave so, is bomb when you come back. I love that. Great. Yep. Get paid to do nothing. <laughs> I got to, uh, I like, you always hear stories of people that get to uh, stick it to higher ups. I like was in the process of signing out and signing out and my shit bag of Sergeant Major came up and he's like, oh, Sergeant Weiss, what are you doing? And I took my DD-214 and went, getting the fuck out of the army, Sergeant Major. And like, everyone in there was like, oh. and he like takes one look at it and he's like, oh, well, good luck to you. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you can't fucking do shit. I'm like, I'm signing out. I'm gone, motherfucker. <laughs> you have no power great. here. It was great. I really want to get one of those blankets, those uh, DD-214 blankets. Hopefully without your information on it. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you can, um, so the DD-214 is like your, your holy grail document that releases you from the military. It says you existed. There is a website that will take your personal DD-214 and make a blanket out of it so you can, you know, shroud yourself in this blanket to protect you from <laughs> the Army's bullshit. It's great. Yeah, But, but also you have to send them your information, which I don't want to do, which is why yeah, I no, There's so it. much <laughs> stuff on there. I would never share that. Yeah, no, there's, that's like literally your entire life in the military on one piece of paper. Did you have a difficult time transitioning back into civilian life? I did initially, actually. Um, I was in for about six years, and... I was always part of a group, part of a unit, always off doing something. It was very engaging constantly. A lot of development. Um, when I got back, I was a little aimless. I didn't like, there's no one telling you what to do. You have to do it on your own. You have some leadership skills as an enli lower enlisted, but you still have that network of support everywhere around you. Um, it actually worked out really well for me getting into the fraternity. Um, because even though there wasn't that like network driving our direction and everything <laughs> like that, there was no direction. There was no direction. <laughs> but there was a bunch of kids getting together, <laughs> pretending they knew what they were doing and making decisions. <laughs> that sounds exactly like the army. Exactly. Uh, I felt yeah. right at home. Yeah. <laughs> the only direction that was going on there was which way is the bar. Yeah, we changed that, though. We actually got them turned around to an academic group and started getting the GPAs up and a lot of good things. I think the military members we had in the fraternity helped out a lot. So I really found a place there, and it helped me get engaged in the university and probably pass my classes for the most part. Drag my ass through a 12-mile Tough Mudder. 
Hey, that was fun, and you would you know it. In hindsight, yes. You want to do a ten mile road march in October? My shoulders kind of bugging you, me. I don't think it's. It's a happen. road march, <laughs> asshole. You, don't, you only need legs. <laughs> My knees That's are... not even true. You carry that eighty pound pack for twelve miles. You tell me mean, it's just it, legs. You don't. <laughs> they they encourage you not to carry more than fifty, which I carried like what sixty the first time. Okay, you're you, supposed to. Carry... You know those freaking tripods they have for the fifty cows. Yeah, they made us carry those fucking things. Well, this 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 ruck march is not. Um, technically military it's it's for a program that i'm gonna plug it again here called um 23rd veteran which is based off the uh the you know the notion that 22 veterans a day commit suicide and i had a buddy in reserves commit suicide last year so i got really involved with this and uh it's a 10 mile road march to raise money for this program every 2500 dollars puts one veteran through their 14 week course and we we raised like three three grand i think when i did it last october we that's didn't have awesome. as much success in um in in duluth but that's because we couldn't convince as many people to make the trek up there but yeah october we're doing it again you should come it'll be fun when in october you don't have to do it at a certain pace you just have to fucking finish it well the first week of october I'm, it's the I'm same it's the same day as kerman's wedding so you're already going to be here and it's at 10 in the morning so there is no time conflict also, if you don't do it, you're an asshole. Yeah, exactly. That's how you talk to me in a fucking <laughs> Tough Mudder. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the thing he's talking about is Tough Mudders, this uh, obstacle course, and all the proceeds, not all the proceeds, but a huge portion of them go to the Wounded Warrior Project. And yeah. uh, we did an additional thing where we actually did a bunch of fundraising events to sponsor our entries into it and then donate about, what was it, like four grand we ended up running yeah. for that over the course of a few months. Um, that's some of the stuff we did in the fraternity and things like that. So I actually, my hat's off to you for keep supporting programs like that. It, yeah, like it's, it's a great it's a great program and, and in hindsight you know it's, it's a lot of fun and oh my god i love yeah, it's that fun, it's fun to do i put a i put a bay mask on uh elevation mask for my first one and it damn near kicked my ass and like the last two miles i was dying i had some <laughs> guy one of the guys in my uh reserve unit had like a backpack on he's like come on keep up and i'm like fuck you guy i got like 50 <laughs> pounds and a like i'm i put an extra three thousand feet on with the mask <laughs> i didn't do that the second time because i'm not an idiot but uh <laughs> Might do it again. It's gonna be fun. Now, on previous episodes, we've talked about how the military prepares you to go to war, but prepping you to come back to a regular lifestyle seems to be a bit of an after afterthought. I mean, would you agree with that? One hundred percent. We had a demob the I think it was was it the second time that was way more involved. Arguably, after we it was our less intense tour, um, but as time goes on, programs do develop a little bit better. Um, but it was mostly rubber stamping paperwork. It was your leadership coming through, handing out a form and saying, be honest, fill out this form. But by the way, if you fill it out and don't say this, we're stuck here. So don't fucking fill it out. <laughs> That's literally what it is. They're yep. like, if you don't want to get stuck here and you actually want to go home, don't say shit, which fucks veterans over for any injuries they have, uh, mental fuck, conditions they may have me over. I have, you know, knees and back that I won't get anything for because I never documented any of that when I was in because I was like, you're always told, you know, just suck it up, push through, which I I was good at. And, uh, yeah, once you get out, there's no paper trail of you having these injuries. So, yeah, it just fucks you. And they don't give you the benefit of the doubt. Like, no, I no, they they treat you like you're a complete piece of shit when you go to the VA and you're like the doctor I had treated me like I was just trying to get as much money as possible from them, which, you know, I, I. I won't disagree with, but at the same time, I actually had these fucking issues. Like, yeah, it's a, it's a shit show sometimes. And yeah. some veterans like literally get, like, I'm not saying that every veteran who's on a hard time that's being caused because of a lack of institutional support, but I'm betting it's a pretty contributing factor. If you take someone, give them a job that does not exist in civilian life. And then you don't give them any resources to support them in transitioning to that. It's not going to happen. It goes back to the original point I make about the, Soldiers who are enlisted and getting out are very young age. They don't know how to navigate these complicated programs of eligibility for vocational rehabilitation, uh, GI Bill benefits, or uh, work programs. They just don't know how to do that. And I'm sorry, like there's so many programs that I went to. I was an intern for the VA in college. And I realized very quickly, the only requirement they have for any position is that you are a veteran, which means that you don't have to know anything about the program or know how to operate it or have any experience using it. And so you get shit advice half the time. And yeah. so uh, that, that bothers me a lot, actually. 
Is there anything the military or the VA or, well, I suppose politicians can change the, to help with that? I'm all for veterans helping people, uh, helping yeah. veterans, but you need skills. Administra- like soldiers are terrible administrators. You need actual training on it instead of just, like, like, like you were saying, like half the time they, they don't know what they're talking about, so they can't help you. Well, it's like I um, always had a goal to go to grad school, and I did go yeah. to grad school. I went to a very cheap undergrad and used my GI Bill because they said, oh, you're going to college, use your GI Bill. It's like, okay. And then you went to a more expensive grad school. Yeah. I... Buried myself in debt because I had no yeah. benefits for my one year of grad school. I no. graduated in 12 months from my graduate program. And if they would have told me, hey, just don't use one of your years of benefits to pay for your grad program, I would have saved over $100,000. Well, they don't tell you shit about that. Because they don't, they don't tell you. They make it seem like you have to use all of it consecutively, which you don't. They make it seem like it's all like real-time benefits, like, you know. 12 months is one calendar year, which it is not. Nope. It's however my, and, and I didn't realize this until I was already like a year into school that again, cause I was looking at like how much time I had left and I'm like, that's not what it is, but they, that's what they told me it was. And I was like, they like, it's just, it's a lot of misinformation and you know, it ends up like, like you were saying, you, you end up getting screwed in the long run because now you're going to graduate school and which is much more than River Falls is. Oh, my God. I almost <laughs> actually so I lost my fellowship that I had because the professor I was going to work for left. And so I had to finance everything. I was like, this is great. Fuck. Great program, but fuck, it's expensive. <laughs> Would you say, is that intentional that they don't really break no. that down and explain to you? Or is I it just somebody that doesn't know? Told some of everything it, on their side? Some of, it is, some of it is, some of it isn't. Um, I think it's... Sometimes they, they try scare tactics to keep you in. Uh, my favorite scare tactic they used on me was, well, you got a kid on the way. Your well child uh, visits are expensive. You need TRICARE for that. And what they don't tell you is that every fucking insurance under the sun covers those visits because it's preventive care on a child. Or not to mention that if you're a veteran but, of any status, you qualify for TRICARE your whole life. Right. Well, do you? Yep. Because they didn't <laughs> tell me that either. I thought you had it. Yeah. yeah. Nope. If you're, if you're a veteran, especially if you've done foreign service, you get tri-care your, qualifications. Your, your family doesn't, though. I know that much. Uh, I don't know about that because I don't have a family. but Because I, I, I did look into like, some coverage. I mean, I, I get pretty good insurance through my company, so I don't really worry about it. But um, they, I know they don't cover your family because they, they covered my, my student health plan, but they would not cover... Um, my my family or my kids like which is it's just, it's just weird the way they do that um, they they really try they do try to keep you in um, they do try they need they bodies will, and like think about the need, money they, they invest bodies, in you and it's it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like prison where they'll set you up like you are not going to succeed on the outside like you need to stay here kind of yep. thing um, and there was a lot, there was quite a few people that bought into that that would like. They'd be like a month from getting out, and then they they just up and reenlist because they'd get they'd get scared. It's terrifying. Like if all you know is military job and you don't know the private sector industry, how to interview because yeah. it doesn't happen because a panel review is not an interview. No, because a because a promotion board and getting screamed at by five people is not an interview. No, and especially <laughs> when you're just quoting off random statistics, there's nothing about like how you are fit for a leadership role or how you right. develop or how you operate. What is this on a map? What what type of weapon is this? Like that actually doesn't mean anything. Yeah. <laughs> just give you a, it's a equivalent of a classroom test with bullying, in my opinion. Did you but feel it's, that's why so many people end up back in prison is because they don't know how to navigate the outside. And, and we were talking about the same way. Last time we were, uh, it was you and Rick and talking about, you know, guys looking for that adrenaline rush again. I remember that. Oh, yeah, I'm definitely guilty thing. of that. Yeah, <laughs> that is that is a thing. Buy a two speed car. Was it, what the hell was that? Oh, Both you're that talking you about. OK, so I bought a. Oh, this is when I was poor. And I should never have done it. <laughs> <laughs> I bought a 1965 Skylark GT that had 500 horsepower and a two-speed super glide transmission. <laughs> I blew that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I skydive, I bungee jump, I rock climb, um, I go to the racetrack. Uh, I was driving Lambos like two weeks ago. Um, not my own, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, I get adrenaline whenever I can. I can't stand sitting around. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about, you know, the military doesn't really teach anything that you can apply to civilian life as far as job-wise. Well, I mean, leader, you were leadership in for, skills they can. The leadership, leadership skills, for sure. 
I, I you're gone. You were in the military for six years. A shitload can change in six years. I mean, do you, is it hard to stay current with what's going on in the private sector? Impossible. I would yeah. say impossible. It's you impossible. every moment of your life, if you're a good soldier, is spent preparing for all that. The, the, um, one, the one thing that you can learn is good leadership skills, and a lot of that you have to be, you have to be pretty self like self motivated on that. Like, because you can skate by being a piece of shit. Like, it's we, a double edged sword. Staff though, too. sergeants who like they'll make it to staff sergeant, and then they're safe, and they just sit there and they be a piece of shit leader for twenty years, and then they retire. Um, but so you really have to be self motivated, and I, like I, I tried like every leader I worked for, like what do they do good that I should emulate? What do they do bad that I should not do? And you know that 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 worked out pretty well for me. But there's I also think. the stigma that they have in the private sector too. There's so yeah. many soldiers who, let's be honest, like just because you're a vet does not mean you are a good worker, or a good person, or anything like no. that. You have to. I'm I'm not trying to say that this is a rule of thumb that all vets are messed up and things like that. Because not true at all. Um, but you need to be able to be critical of the members of the institution and the institution itself. The military can make mistakes that's comprised of human leadership. The members can make mistakes comprised of human members. It's going to happen. And because of that, workers, institutions, have gotten military employees with this whole stereotype, oh, you must have leadership skills, you are in the military. And those shitbirds that get out after doing nothing for 20 years yeah. just make everyone lose faith in you. So you have to work doubly hard to prove that you have that skill that everyone expects you to already have. There is that stigma on um, PTSD, too. I had a, a guy that had... He had gotten out as as an E5, um, worked in contracting for a bit, and then came back in as an E4, had a clause way back up to E5. And he uh, he said when he was contracting, like they'd interview someone because um, he did mostly military contracting. And then they uh, after the interview, they'd ask him, like, so what do you think? Does he have PTSD? And he'd be like, how is this a relevant fucking question? But there is such a stigma on that. like, And it's why like I have gone like to great lengths to not have mine diagnosed like i will not have it diagnosed because like then it's like it's on your record and there's like if we can say what we want about like how the strides we've made as a country in mental health like they and ptsd still has so much stigma attached into it attached to it a lot of it's like media the media's fault too like you see so many shows where there's the ptsd stricken veteran who goes on a shooting rampage which is highly inaccurate like it mostly just manifests itself as like pretty much identically to depression but there's so much there's so much misunderstanding on that nowadays i I would encourage anyone who has ptsd to go get it diagnosed get it treated i understand there's a stigma there but the risk of like what that can do to you over time is not don't 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 follow my example on that (laughs) yeah thank you for saying that (laughs) i appreciate that i'm not i'm in no way endorsing that thought i'm just i'm really paranoid about it Please, like, if you're listening to this, it's it's real you though. Think like, you have it? Don't follow my example and get it diagnosed. But it is that stigma is real. Just be aware of that. And it, the stigma is real, and the paranoia about and it is, in my opinion, is paranoia. I had the same thing. Yeah. I was out for years and years, and finally, um, I wasn't there because I was having a hard time dealing with like um, the image of myself, other people. It's like, and I'm sure you can relate to this. Like, there's things you do that are not. No one's proud of. Like, you had to do it. It was the right thing to do, but it's still nothing pleasant that you would ever wish on anyone to have to do. And so I went out to get therapy, and they really encouraged me, like, you need to go talk about your PTSD with the VA and everything like that. It's like they understand it, you know it, and they can relate to it. And it was one of the best programs I did. One of the reasons why I'm here today is because I still struggle with this, and having fellow veterans to talk to and put the ideas through, and also to get awareness out through the channel, I think is an amazing opportunity. Um, so if anyone has PTSD, I have PTSD, please go talk to somebody. It doesn't do medical professional, but I do think they help a lot. And there is stigma. Steve is 100% correct. But the alternative of what could happen to you or to others who don't have an outlet is way worse. To put that in perspective, um, I had a buddy in reserves who was a Cav Scout. And so we were like the only two um, actual, like, combat experienced veterans in our brigade because we worked in a reserve engineering brigade and most people that have been deployed had gone to you know kuwait bosnia wherever. reserves don't have combat units anymore do they, they don't um he had actually reclassed to 12 bravo i had um used school as an excuse not to reclass because you know i have that that weird pride that comes with being <laughs> a grunt like i'm not fucking reclassing <laughs> to a pogue mos and uh we like they tasked us out with everything like with all the lanes that they would throw at us um at our annual training which 
were actually harder because they would throw all the stupid stuff like, you know, all of a sudden you've got um, indirect fire coming in. Oh, now it's a gas attack. Oh, now it's a near ambush. And like, how's it a fucking near ambush if they just had gas an artillery strike and a gas attack? Like they killed their own guys. But so we had all these. The They're shit. Russian, obviously. Yeah. So <laughs> they were actually really good, like good as far as like Reaction you're never time. going to face anything yeah. as difficult as that. But the two of us got tasked out with leading all of that. And so I spent a lot of time with him. We had a lot of good conversations um, about that. And he had a lot of things that he had done that he wasn't proud of. And I like it was. I don't know if it was a misstep on my part, but I didn't realize exactly how much he was struggling with that. And like a month after we got back, he shot himself with a shotgun. Like waited until his wife went to work. Waited until like his father-in-law was coming over, so his wife wouldn't be the one who found him. And then he and then he shot himself. So it and and I know he never got his diagnosed. Um, so it is and it, like none of us really saw that one coming. Um, like I said, I had like small glimpses and I just underestimated it. So if you even like think that you have PTSD, please go get that. Like talk to someone. It doesn't even have to be the VA. No, any kind of professional help or even just your friends because they will always be there for you. Like I know it feels like you don't have anybody sometimes, but your friends will be there. Gordon's been a great shoulder for me many times, more than I probably care to admit. <laughs> um, well, that's why they're so broad. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Not as broad as you got. Do you keep in touch with anyone that you were serving with and you know had those kind of conversations with them? It's weird. Um, a lot of us, I don't know, maybe this is different for you, but it's awkward for us to talk about it because we have to admit stuff was going on and things like that. So yeah. I am much more comfortable talking with things like that with people outside of the unit for the most part. Um, like, even though we all know we were doing the right stuff, there's a little bit of shame on it. And we know if we bring it out to each other, we're all going to feel like shit. Right. And so group and stuff is great, but I don't know if like doing it with your group is the best of things to do. Because then you have to admit to somebody that you're there, and if, especially if you're still active, like you guys were in the reserve, you're admitting you, you're not mentally ready to help out. Yeah, I'm, I'm still technically on uh, IR. Um, so, you know, they could... Uh, That's a burden to have to deal with that. And to admit that to someone's huge. So... Yeah, I mean, there's there's some stuff we could talk about. We had, a, we had a, a death in our platoon, actually on my team, while I was over there, which we talked about in the first shows on and like that i i could talk about but like all the other stuff that went on like there was a lot of uh i won't call it underhanded but there was definitely some um questionable activities massaging of the rules of engagement that you know yeah i would not talk about with uh people who were over there with me no because you one of the things i saw was calling out people who messed up that's a huge thing i live yeah. with right now is Stuff that people you know, and you know they're not necessarily bad people, they did some really fucked up shit. And so, at what point is your responsibility to say something, do something, or if you already didn't do something, is that your fault? You can't change that ever in the past. No. And I think a lot of the things uh, veterans live with that really, unfortunately, drives this kind of behavior of the 22 a day is, is guilt. It's guilt and shame. And so... I know it was I know it was for, uh, for him. That was a lot I talked about, like... Cause he was, he was pretty religious and a lot of it was like, how does he reconcile some of the, like the stuff that he did and some of the, like the people that he killed, how does he reconcile that with being a Christian? And he had a really hard time with that. I, I, I understand more, that mo entirely. more so than, you know, any of us thought. So, and that's where the military I think needs to start stepping up. There's a lot of publicity around this 22 a day thing. It's a catchy slogan. I'll give you that, but it's um, kind of a warp statistic to be honest. It is. It's not quite that high, um, but it's. It's I mean, and, and to maintain high. that kind of consistency over time, it'd be pretty weird. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I've looked into it after you brought it up the first time I looked at, it, and some numbers are way higher, some are yeah, way lower, it's, and it's well, it's, it's, it's going to be whatever sample you get, and some areas are going to be higher. So, and like, there's, right. you're never going to get a true number of how many right. veterans actually, um, unfortunately, take their life every day. But um, we but, we can agree that it's it's too many. That's any a lot. any is too any, many. Any is too many. It's it's quite a few um i've known at least two uh, I, I have found like one of the things that helps me deal with my PTSD is um actually doing things that make me face mortality it's it sounds I, stupid i've heard getting outside as well like just doing anything anything outdoors yep um going you know going to school the last three years and having 
two kids, I haven't had as much an opportunity to do that, but I'm really trying to get back into it because I've heard that that is uh, a really like just even just like hiking, biking, you know, rock climbing. Rock. I play. I about. do rock climbing. I do tennis like every week. Like I cannot. If I did not have activity in my life. I I do not even want to imagine where I would be. Like it would not be a good place. And I and I like a lot of veterans take great care to like do the things that keep us away from those thoughts and those behaviors. Um, and I have some great friends that help me do it. Like I don't do it alone. And like you're not, no one can. I don't care who you are, how strong you are, whatever. You cannot do it alone. So um, I'm only here the way I am because a I have great friends I met right after I got out, and they took care of me every time I had a bad day. And there's been a lot of bad days. So um, definitely take care of yourself and let your friends do the same for you. For anyone that's looking at going into the military, I mean, would you offer them any advice? I struggle with that because I do believe the military is necessary, but I do believe it has issues. And so I have a little brother who wants to join the Army active duty, and I really applaud his willingness to serve and contribute to something and be something bigger than himself. I worry because I care about him a lot. He's like, he's one of my favorites. Don't tell anybody I said that. <laughs> um, Edit that out, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I struggle with because I know they the pains that I've gone through and the experience that I've had, I do not want him to ever do that. So I'm trying super hard to find him another alternative other than the military to have a career that he's satisfied and happy with. Um, that being said, if you don't have other options, it's a good way to get your life set up. I, I don't think it's a default good thing for everybody. Um, but I don't think it's a bad thing either. It depends. So I will give different advice to any individual probably based upon their current situation. Start a podcast. They're cheap. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you bomb off other people's equipment, Gordon. <laughs> He's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Matt. Thanks again, Matt. Jesus, for coming down tonight. Uh, again, appreciate it. And thank you for everyone for tuning into this episode. If you'd like to stay up to date for future guests and live recordings, uh, check the show out on Facebook and Instagram, both under No Story Left Behind. And don't forget to check out my other show called Rules of the Arena. You can find the show on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Bureau, YouTube, and Twitch, all under Rules of the Arena Podcast. Available for download and streaming on BlindNinjaStudios.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, and CastBox. If you are a veteran, uh, we can't stress this enough, uh, in a bad spot, please reach out, talk with Battle Buddy, friend, family, or maybe someone you know and are concerned about. Please reach out. You can call one 800 273 8255 or text 838255 to speak with a caring, qualified VA responder available 24-7. Thank you again, everyone, for listening, and we will catch you next time.